I just landed in your town. Hello out there. You are listening to KPCA LP, Petaluma, California, 103.3 FM. You can reach us online if you aren't right now at kpca.fm and by email at kpca at pca.tv. Um, if you'd like to reach us via snail mail, you can get that at P.O. Box 2806, Petaluma, California, 949 Five three. Um, I am testing all of my equipment right now, so I'm going to actually test the audio while we're at it because we're learning as we go. Um, I also wanted to take a second. So a lot has occurred since my last show, and so I want to address some of those things here um, prior. So we experienced some pretty significant fires in uh, Sonoma County. And uh, it wasn't quite covered on the national news in a, a way that I would necessarily appreciate. So I just want to take a moment um, to recognize all of those who were first responders, volunteers, um, and professionals. I think that's an often forgotten um, population because they're not, they may not be volunteering their time, but um, like all the first responders, they're doing a great job. And... Uh, that goes, you know, to all hospital staff and anyone else that was greatly affected. Uh, as a local business, I know that we're working really hard to figure out how to move forward because inevitably it impacts all of us in different ways. So I just wanted to take a second to um, react to that. Again, if you're on my live Facebook feed, that's where I can take questions uh, during the show. And uh, you can find that at uh, the DG the 30 something page. And that way, that's how I take all my questions. So let's get into it. Uh, because it's been a couple months since my last show, I did want to review uh, a few things. I, I wanted to reintroduce myself because I realized uh, that many people don't actually know about my past and why I'm doing this show. I think it's really important and it speaks to why I do this show. So. Um, again, I, you know, I started working for the Sonoma County Public Health Department when I was 19 years old, so that was quite some years ago. I can't do the math. 12 years ago. Just told you my age. Obviously a 30-something. Uh, and from that point, I knew that that was kind of my path in life, so I spent a lot of time working within county and government agencies throughout my career. I actually did disaster relief in Santa Barbara during the fires there, so it was my inclination as soon as the fire started here. To find somewhere to go and then um, I moved on to get my undergrad degree in psychology but I could not really choose a major so I chose uh, you know I changed it four times I think I went from biology to biopsychology to biz econ to psychology so I had a very diverse uh, education and uh, from that point I got my master's in public health and that's kind of where I've landed now and that is why my show is a nonpartisan conversation about policy uh, and the issues that are facing the United States and I really stress the nonpartisan part I try to present uh, policy and changes that affect all of us in a very factual and straightforward way so that's my goal uh, you know I did want to review some of my past shows a lot of my shows uh, have been which I'm working to get archived on my website, but you can find on Facebook. A lot of my past shows have been on, we've covered health care. My first show was a response to Jared Huffman's town hall in Petaluma. That was very well attended. So I did a response to that and talked about the potential changes to the Affordable Care Act and how that would impact especially people uh, in my demographic. I have also done shows uh, addressing DACA and the changes to that legislation as well as the violence in Charleston. A lot of my shows are very health focused because again, that's my, um, that is my training, that's my passion, but I do wanna open it up and um, I am looking for guests and new ideas and some of the really important issues that I would like to address is housing, uh, which I've been trying to address even before the fires, so I think it's e even more of a poignant issue. So if you are an expert in housing or no one, um, please, Please send them my way. Uh, I would like to also do a show on cannabis policy as we're watching that unravel right in front of us. And then I think another thing is just general city planning, civic planning. Um, 
kind of the same kind of you know planning that would occur at a private company and i think that the the fires really brought to light the uh uh the lack of city planning um and county planning for these types of issues because we never think it's going to happen to us so i think that's a really important consideration to make also um any other ideas that people have uh, we're coming up on an election year after the first of the year and so i know that that sound issues on Facebook. Is anyone else having sound issues on Facebook? Maybe there's just a delay. Um, so anyway, let's get into it. Um, yeah, why is it playing back? Uh, so let's get into it. I have a few different topics today, and um, I wanted to start with one that I think that a lot of people don't uh, know about. It's called the Champion Act. And that sounds that stands for the Community Health and Medical Professional Im imp Medical Professionals Improve Our Nation. Federal government loves like really long names for things. So it was shortened to the Champion Act. Um, I thought it was very catchy, <laughs> and very quirky. So I wanted to talk about uh, basically this act and how it can potentially impact the entire nation. So this act improves certain public health services. What it does do, it, it is, uh, it extends the community health centers and National Health Service Corp services. It is an extension for the Special Diabetes Program, SDPI, for those of us that are in the industry, that's actually one of the grants I manage right now. Um, so that's a good thing. And it uh, improves family to family health info centers. I would love for someone to define that for me because I'm not really sure what that is. I know what a health center is. I think perhaps they're getting at community resource centers, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what a family to family health info center is. So if anyone knows, let me know. And, and I should start by saying all this information um, was taken directly off of the United States government website. They have, uh, because this legislation is still in process, they basically give reports by committees um, based on it. So this all this information is coming directly from the report that was presented to um, and will be presented to the Senate and House of Representatives. So, and then it also in extends the youth impairment program. Admittedly, there probably is more information about all these things, but I didn't want to get into a, you know, three hour lecture in an hour long time. So, of course, with any legislation, there's offsets. So an offset is something they have to reduce funding in order to approve extensions or to increase funding to other sources. That's how you balance a budget. Um, so one of them is that they're changing the grace period for uh, Affordable Care Act uh, enrollees. Currently, the program allows for a three month grace period if you do not pay your fees for a certain amount of months. Uh, they are reducing that to one month federally unless the state itself has a different law dictating a different time period for that. So I'm going to get into my analysis of all this at the end, but uh, it seems like a very small change, but they're basically, in my opinion, turfing it off to the states to make the improvement uh, and for the most part. And then again, those states that already have a law intact, that will be upheld. But federally, it will only be uh, one month. The analysis says that this is to avoid confusion, uh, confusion, abuse, or waste by aligning grace periods to Medicaid and Medicare. So it's predicted that people will be less confused if the uh, deadlines uh, uh, align with Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, I personally, as a public health professional, didn't even know that that was in the legislation, the, the specific grace period. It makes sense, but I didn't know that was in legislation. So that's the first one. They uh, want to reduce funding to the prevention and public health fund. Uh, I've seen stats that uh, are up to is a reduction of a, by 75% of the budget over a certain amount of years. And um, that fund 
for, uh, is administered by the Health and Human Services, and it actually supports a lot, a very large amount of prevention programming nationally, mainly through uh, uh, grants to several different agencies. So I want to get into kind of some of the interesting things that I noted uh, while reading the legislation. And again, it, I always kind of try to stress this because it was incredibly confusing and I had a very hard time understanding what they were saying. I had to read it over and over. And again, I was reading committee notes based on the drafted legislation. So there's still processes that have to go forth before it's in full legislation. I think of the little Capitol Hill scene and <laughs> I'm just a bill. So um, it, was, it was reviewed by the Committee on Energy and Commerce. And you know, while I know a lot about government processes, I found this to be a very interesting fact. I wasn't quite, uh, I didn't quite understand why this was the committee that was reviewing it. And, um, and I was kind of curious to know what, uh, what background they would have in a public health realm. Uh, don't get me wrong, there are energy people, uh, especially green energy people that do have some sort of a public health background or an understanding of it, but I just found it to be really interesting that this committee was who reviewed it, again, the energy and commerce, and that's where all the notes came from. And, you know, some of the major issues is the, the significant reduction to the public health fund. That would impact a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I made a note that the public health fund is actually administered by Health and Human Services. So again, uh, I think this kind of touches on, I know it touches on the disconnect between policy making and operations of programs. Uh, I've been talking about this for a long time because I believe in inside out creation of policies where you think about the operations and how it's going to be implemented and then address the policy development around it. Unfortunately, that's not how our system works. It's more outside in. So we develop the policy and then push it to the people on the ground to figure it out. And that's been my experience working in government is that's very often is that the legislators have one idea of how the programming is going to work, but it doesn't actually have a grounding in actual program operations. So that was a very interesting kind of point uh, that was made. I do want to say that this was already passed through the House of Representatives. So this is already moving through, and again, I, I feel like it's, it m I haven't really met anyone that has heard about this unless you are really involved in the public health side of things. So basically, this is a very flawed bill because we need our health centers and we also need our, our prevention fund. And we also need to make sure that people have extended access to health care, whatever that looks like. And there's something really interesting that this legislation does. Uh, in my past shows, I talked a lot about microaggressions of the current uh, House and Senate at the federal level, is that it seems like they're implanting very small, what looks like small changes from the outside in the legislation which could potentially have a very significant impact. And again, we see that across a lot of legislation. Uh, and, and unfortunately, um, these details are pushed under the carpet. So, so things like this, I, my last show is on DACA, and a lot of people were protesting the changes, but they didn't actually know how that came to be. Uh, and I think I even said that when I did my last show, I had to read the legislation or the memorandum about the legislation ten, uh, at least 10 times before I could even bullet point it and, and kick it back. So um, this one was a little bit more straightforward to me in this form. So personally, it seems like, yes, we're increasing access. Uh, I brought up my public health training because I did a lot of research in the area of access. Uh, this is kind of an old school uh, opinion. I, I think I graduated school seven or eight years ago. So even when I was in there, this was an old school opinion that sheer access improved health outcomes. Uh, and that's just not true because there you can have direct access, which is important. It's a definitely an important piece of it. Uh, you need to have ask it access to health centers and medical professionals. But beyond that, you have to have a way to access those services. 
and you also need to want to access those services. There's a lot of barriers to access that are beyond the physical distance of a clinic or a health center or a hospital. There's a lot of cultural, cultural, social, religious, fear-based uh, uh, issues, especially after DACA. The DACA laws were changed. Uh, there, there's a lot of fear uh, around people accessing services that are provided by the government. So mm, my prediction, perhaps a little early, is that this extension of community health centers, while we're reducing uh, the prevention and public health fund, is to, I don't want to say this, I don't think it's a partisan statement, but is to push big pharma. Because if people aren't being provided with the prevention services, which have shown statistically to actually make people be well and make the changes that they need to to be well, um, we're then going to keep them sick. Uh, that's been my public health opinion for quite some time. I think that, uh, and I have just on my paper, like de decrease in prevention services keeps people sick. Uh, and we've seen that throughout our history. And I think I talked a lot about this in my first radio show, just about how prevention is key. And I guess the major thing for me, and I have to do, I always have to take a step back because I am a public health professional, but I don't understand intuitively how in funding prevention services, and again, all the data is there, that uh, funding prevention services is less than funding health centers. Uh, again, I think that they're both necessary. A 75% reduction in the public health fund would be devastating. Devastating um, to health and human services. And, and before the current administration went into office, there was a lot of fear within health and human services, the public health departments, and everyone at the health and human services uh, works with about this kind of thing occurring. Uh, that there was a, <laughs> there was almost a promise. There was a, a, a it was a statement saying that these services were going to be reduced. And so, when I talk about microaggressions of government, I think that this is a way that you're almost going to wipe out an entire public health fund, which makes people lose jobs. It makes people lose access to programming. Uh, and I don't think that the overall outcome of this will be good. Uh, in, in assessing this and this legislation. Uh, again, you know, I think that the verdict's still out on what some of these other programs they are extending, what the data is. Again, I think they're front-loading it by saying that they're going to increase, uh, you know, our extension of the Community Health Centers and National Health Service Corps. I think they're front-loading it with the information we want to hear. But then as you go down, uh, you kind of start to wonder, well, why is the, that, you know, that, why is that being reallocated to that place? Uh, so I have a lot of questions about that financially. And, and again, I talked about it when uh, I did my response to the, the Jared Huffman show, is that the reduction in ACA, you know, I think within Sonoma County it was even predicted, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was predicted that we'd, learn, we'd lose 40% of the workforce in that sector. Um, that were strictly hired based on the ACA changes. So we're talking about, you know, advocates that have been hired, uh, enrollment officers with their titles, all the people that are working to enroll people, all those jobs were created by ACA. And so I feel that the same thing would occur if that the public health fund is reduced by the significant amount is that a lot of people would lose their jobs and a lot of people would lose access to necessary prevention services. Uh, because that's what we know in public health is essential to keeping the country healthy. And we have seen over the history, really, of the country that a lot of the medical system is based on services, medication, um, and again, in my opinion, that keeps people sick. Uh, and that's not a way to address the major issues in, in the country. So this kind of rolls into something else that occurred. And uh, I think everyone noticed last month, um, it's open enrollment time right now. And there was a huge reduction in advertising for open enrollment and support for open enrollment. Uh, I'm not sure what, the, I think it actually, I, you know, I think I actually saw a statistic that that backfired uh, and that even more people uh, enrolled because 
again, I, I would I would suggest it's a lot of the power of social media uh, and people being able to reach in many different outlets. And so they were able to get the word out that open enrollment was occurring. So what people noticed in 2018 that all premiums went up an average of 30%. It's a very significant increase. Uh, you know, mine went up $100 a month just starting in 2018 after one year. And that's really unfortunate because uh, I have Kaiser and I was really proud of them because they've actually been reducing premiums until this last year and it went up 30%. And I wonder if this Champion Act goes through, how that will even further impact the premiums increasing because we're lowering the, the uh, we're lowering the grace period for payment of services, which is projected to save a bunch of money. Obviously, you're kicking a bunch of people off insurance. You're going to save money after one month. And then, uh, again, we are incre increasing uh, access to community health centers. But what I find to be the contradiction in this legislation is that it seems to me that we are increasing access while decreasing insurance and decreasing prevention. So what's the net? of that and how well has that been assessed by the energy and commerce committee who reviewed this legislation uh and and that's i mean they have the numbers you can actually see the numbers if you just google the champion act and you go to the united states government website you can see everything that's been done you can see the notes the transcripts i just went to the latest one and the most complete one that i could find and and so I, you know I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions about this. Again, policy is usually developed in an outside in instead of an inside out process because how could the legislators in DC be super connected to every person that's on the ground doing programming? I mean, you know, they aren't <laughs> in short. So, you know, and that that's an issue. Uh, and I've always seen it as an issue throughout my entire career. So, uh, I'm going to completely change gears, and actually it's going to come full circle. We've had a lot going on in the country lately, and so it's been very hard for me to kind of identify where I should spend my time. So I'm just hoping that I'm able to kind of bring it back home full circle. But I do kind of want to change gears. I think these issues are in fact linked, and perhaps you will um, think the same once I'm done. So. I wanted to go into gun violence. I uh, stray away from saying gun control because it usually has a very charged reaction among people. So I am going to not use the word c gun control. I am actually not going to suggest a necessary change. I am going to do my analysis of things that have happened and if anyone has any input, please share it with me so that I can respond to that, but there's something really important that's going on right now, and uh, and I'll bring this full circle, is that a lot of things are being put back on the state. We talked about it with DACA, we talked about it with the Champion Act, we talked about it with ACA reform, and the same thing seems to be happen happening with a regard to addressing gun violence. So. We just have this ongoing theme, and I'm not going to say why, but I think it's pretty clear to people that are watching why that's occurring, uh, and it's polarizing. Uh, it's very polarizing, uh, and this issue is very polarizing, which is why I bring that connection, is that if all of a sudden it's not a national issue that needs to be addressed, and it's just state to state, then there isn't that unity and traction. Uh, that that we have you know we have a certain bubble in California and then you know there's a different feeling in Arizona and then there's a different feeling in Massachusetts there's a different feeling in Florida for sure in Texas so this issue always becomes incredibly polarized so I'm gonna do my best to present some facts about the issue and uh, let all of you kind of assess and look at what this looks like. So all of the uh, information to follow is from CNN.com. The article is by AJ Willingham and Saheed Ahmed. 
I am happy if you contact me to send you the actual link because they do cite every single source. I'm not going to do that here uh, in lieu of time. However, it is important to note that these are data points that were brought in from different research institutions like the Pew Institute and, and people that study these things uh, on a regular basis. So I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, I left out the subjectivity. So there has been a increase in shootings. So I think it was in 2015, they, oh, sorry, on average over the change, there has been 307 shootings of four more, which by definition is a mass shooting in this country um, on average every year. There are, let me think, and I think, okay, I think I actually have the statistic. Oh, we'll get to it. Uh, so there are almost 34,000 gun deaths in the United States a year. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that 21,000 of those are suicide related. So actually a majority are suicide. Oh, I did put that as the, the, the Brady Center's uh, statistic. So we've experienced the deadliest shootings in the United States in the last 10 years, uh, which again, I find to be very interesting because we've been a country for a very long time. Uh, those included, of course, are Vegas and Florida. Uh, within the last 10 years. So from 1966 to 2012, one third of the mass shootings in the United States, uh, one third, sorry, one third of the mass shootings have been in the United States and the world. So even though we're only 5% of the world's population. So basically one third of the total mass shootings in the United States uh, in the world came from the United States and per capita, we're only 5% of the world population. Uh, the U.S. has the most shootings by country. Uh, the number is 90 versus, I believe this is a month, 90, uh, and that's the, or it was an average. Uh, the next closest nation that has the most shootings is the Philippines, and they're at 18. So you can see the vast difference there. Uh, there is a very large misconception in the most dangerous places to experience shootings. Uh, we often, a lot in the media lately has been shootings at churches and uh, I think that's probably because it is a place that people would feel exceptionally safe, but actually the most dangerous locations are at schools and businesses uh, because there's a more high density of people there and my heart goes out. There was a shooting in Northern California today uh, in, I think it was in a couple different locations, one of which was a school. So we have yet another example um, of schools being a dangerous place. Also, I find it to be very interesting, it's not my notes, but they did note that both, both the shootings uh, at, at the last church and the shooting today occurred by males who had a history of domestic violence connection between domestic violence and gun violence and you know it's violence in general but i think those are really important facts and they bring up very different issues than gun control uh by by statute so uh let me see so the another interesting fact is that gun sales actually spike after a, a, a mass shooting i I think this is driven by fear and media and the, the feeling of instability that's created through media. And that is a huge thing. Again, I'll kind of circle back to all this as I always do. If you've watched my show before, you kind of know the theme that always comes up. Uh, so I'll circle back to that. Um, and then, so the most guns owned in the world are uh, in the US. The second highest nation is Yemen and they have a little over half as many guns as the United States does. And uh, I, I, I intentionally chose to end on this one, but three-fourths of gun owners say it's essential to their freedom to have a gun. So this is where we're really getting into the heart of the issue about gun violence is that people, I'm going to come back to the fact that people are polarized. So every time this comes up, and everyone's seen it, uh, there is a huge polarization effect where the one side says we need gun control, the other side says don't take my guns away, and really the proposal is down the middle. And there is this idea, you know, the right to bear arms, 
it, it, you know, it, that is a thing. Uh, I wish, I wish I actually wrote down what that means. I think it's something along the lines of the right to bear arms and, you know, against your own government, actually, I think is what the legislation does. I, I've done a lot of analysis of the Constitution, but I don't have that one. I don't have that one memorized, but, uh, you know, and maybe, you know, I actually think I want to bring that up because that is a really important fact here. Uh, let's see. Uh, and, of course, our Constitution has a lot of interpretations, which we see throughout a lot of situations. But I think that there was a very clear depiction of this. If you actually study constitutional law, and, and it's really interesting because getting back to the media fact is that a lot of what I see in the media, as I always say, is very polarized. So on the one side, you see actually inaccurate interpretations of the, like blatantly inaccurate interpretations of the Constitution. Uh, and so there's this huge disagreement. I, Sarah Palin has a talk show now, and uh, she talked about how all the constitutional writers were religious. But if you actually look at, yeah, they're, you know, they're religious, gun-bearing, you know, uh, that they believed in all that kind of stuff. But when you actually look at a lot of what they said and why they wrote the Constitution, it was actually the complete opposite. So you can see very quickly how these issues get polarized. She's blatantly saying inaccurate information. Uh, again, people can argue with me. They can say it's open to interpretation. A lot of my constitutional law research suggests that they were actually non-religious, and the reason they wrote the Constitution was to separate church and state in the true form. They were also escaping persecution from England, and so why would they then want to take all that with them? So I think that's a really important fact, and again, I'm not trying to be partisan about it. I use Sarah Palin as an example, but it does show the polarization of information when in fact, you know, there aren't that many constitutional lawyers around. It's very difficult. Uh, but let's see. Let me read this to you. I think I'm not going to do the whole thing, but let's see. Is this the actual... I don't want all the history. I want what it actually says. Okay. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This is very interesting. I, and I, I, as the logical person I am, I actually don't know how this m is misconstrued, but it's because it's very clear. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I interpret this as the people have a right to create a militia and bear arms against their own freedom. Now, and I think that this is where the, mis, the misconstrued, misconstrued points can come in because people think it's essential to their freedom, but actually this is saying that in, in my interpretation that you can bear arms against your own government if it's not serving you. And that's the right to bear arms. It's the right to bear arms against your own government in order to keep your freedom. Now, it's very easy to see how that is then translated to I have the right to bear arms period uh, and I'm not saying that there isn't necessarily a in you know that that's not part of what this is trying to say but I think that in application gun owners and I don't have this as a fact but gun owners saying it's essential to their freedom three quarters of them are saying it's essential to their freedom is very much disconnected with what the Constitution reads. Uh, if you actually talk to people who are gun owners, it, it's for safety, it's for, you, might, you know, they might be for hunting, it might be for a lot of other reasons. So assessing that it's essential to their freedom is a different kind of argument. And there is something to be said by the huge increase in mass shootings in the United States. This isn't by chance. This isn't random. This isn't, uh, and basically all the research shows us, except for the really skewed blog articles, I don't call that research. What the research shows us that actually countries that have less access to guns have less gun violence. I mean, it's kind of logical. It's, it's a, a logical deduction. 
uh, while countries that have easier access and more access to guns have more mass shootings. So I know this is a very sensitive topic, especially after Vegas happened. That was a, a very public setting. And, you know, as well as Florida, that happened. That was in a nightclub. It was clearly uh, geared towards a certain population. Vegas was a little bit broader of a spectrum. But what I really want to address here is the, and the reason I brought it up is because of the polarization that occurs as soon as one of these mass shootings happens. The silver lining with this, between this and other legislation is that we hear about these things and there's data about these things. The Champion Act, like I said, how many people heard about that? So I think that, as I always do, we need to take a step back from what media is feeding us in order to look and follow the, follow the facts because, you know, media is telling us that yes, shootings are an issue. The one side says, don't take my guns. The other, I, uh, the other side says, let's take away the guns. Really, most of it is in the middle where it's saying, now let's just regulate it so it's harder to get them. It's harder to get your hands on guns. Uh, and, and again, I, just, I keep coming back to the statistic that a significant amount of the gun deaths a year are suicide-based. And uh, that's really tragic. It's a very tragic statistic. It speaks to the broader mental health issues we have in this country. I don't think this is just a gun violence issue, but it does bring back to our uh, stigma and our inhibiting access to services. And again, I want to distinguish that when I say access to services, I'm not talking about sheer access to health centers. I'm actually talking about culturally appropriate, uh, age-specific, yada 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 access to services which is why we need that prevention fund i'm going to keep pushing that super hard uh and because those issues aren't addressed federally and systematically we start having these kind of issues and i'll go ahead and say it and uh i know people aren't going to like it but again all the stats are there is that uh when a white man commits a shooting he is mentally ill and if it's a person of color, they're a terrorist. And uh, a high statistic of the shootings that occur in the United States are white men, and many of which have a history with domestic violence. So I think that that's a really important messaging piece that occurs. For me, it's everyone's one thing or everyone's the other thing. It's not because of the color of your skin, you're one thing versus the other. And I'm not making a suggestion about mental health. I think that it... There's a lot that kind of goes into the capacity to do these kind of things. Uh, but it always comes back to that polarization and the inclination towards violence. I mean, most people, I, I'm so, the one thing I can say that I'm, I'm, I'm happy about is that when I was growing up, any time a shooting occurred, I think even when Columbine occurred, they said, oh, they seemed perfectly normal. They seemed... And I think that that spoke to the lack of recognition of what contributes to these situations. Because, you know, if, if we're not able to identify the potential, you know, I don't want to call them red flags, but if we're not able to identify the potential problems that can occur that result in these issues because our healthcare system is so fragmented and we don't treat a person, we treat an illness, which again is how we get back to the changes, is that we're treating... In this country, we're still treating illnesses. We're not treating people. Uh, and, and that, and that uh, drives our insurance costs up. It drives our pharmaceutical costs up. They're crazy, crazy expensive in this country compared to other ones. And uh, that's not just based on the standard of living. That's kind of the argument that's usually said. It's like, well, it's more expensive to do business here, so we have to jack up the price 100 times more than another country. Uh, and so... And I'm not against all pharma. I think that medication is necessary in many cases, but I think systematically we're addressing disease and illness. And by removing prevention funding and increasing clinical funding, that's exactly what we're showing. And, and I don't, you know, I, I know people that run health clinics. I know people that have started health clinics. So I don't want to suggest that that isn't also a necessary service. 
But I think that there is a goal here that we're not seeing. This isn't this isn't a practical legislation and it's already gone through one of the steps. So I, I really encourage people to think about this. And, and I don't have all the answers. I, I, I think that my major issue is that the general thing is that we want to keep people sick in this country because it's big, big business. And we also want to keep them polarized because why, while polarized, they won't actually necessarily that's necessarily build a militia to go against you know and I'm not I'm never a supporter of violence but I think this polarization makes it so the what we won't actually work together to stand up to the government uh, in order to make the changes that are necessary and I, I you know someone brought it up the other day completely unsolicited and I talked about it in my last show because uh, I did a lot I've done a lot of research on totalitarianism uh, dictatorships and there's a systematic thing that occurs and someone just brought it up again yesterday again totally unsolicited but we were totally on the same page that what you see in totalitarian nations uh, and I've been predicting this for about 10 years what you see is that there's certain steps that always occur. Uh, the media is taken over by propaganda. They literally send away, they, they, they uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? They uh, deport academics. And, uh, and then they start uh, controlling people and polarizing them for one reason or the other. In very large totalitarian societies they they were able to do that by saying you know the the smart academics are are uh, trying to brainwash you for their ideas but the government is here to show you that we have the truth and we're going to take care of you a lot of these situations have happened after a serious turmoil and so people need something to believe in and when you have a very charismatic leader and uh, they tell you what you want to hear and you're already polarized and the academics are silenced and we see this in the current administration is most everyone that's been assigned to cabinet has little to no experience in that field because if you did have experience in that field you would probably feel differently because you'd be an actual expert in that field it's the same thing with medical research or scientific research I always tell people look at who paid for the study because that will tell you the outcome Hands down. Hands down that will tell you the outcome. Who paid for that study? I remember Coca-Cola paid for a study that negated the uh, need for water intake by basically saying that any fluid intake was good for the human body. Uh, they've also helped fund, uh, not Coca-Cola, but the, the larger company helped fund research to say that sugar wasn't the problem and something else was the problem. Okay, well, in cor correlational science, you can manipulate the data quite a bit. And so I think that when that starts occurring, and it's been going on for a very long time. This is going on for a really, really long time. Uh, like I said, I think I said, you know, during my DACA and, and Charlton, uh, Charleston talk last month, I think this is going on for 100 years at least. Um, we in this country claim to be trying to seek freedom, but at some point, these tendencies of polarization, propaganda, uh, and misinformation started. And this is actually even shocking to me because I hadn't really made the correlation before that by pushing everything and claiming everything's a state's rights is very polarizing because we are a United States. And so we have to come to agreement on certain things. And don't get me wrong, I think that states should have the right to choose in certain circumstances but the example of DACA, the state, of, the state of Texas and its constituents sued the federal government saying this was a state right and that they would, you know, take further action if it wasn't rescinded. Uh, you know, I think that that's a big misstep uh, that, that's occurring. And I, I'm concerned that with a lot of these other issues that are on the forefront are now states' issues while all this other legislation is going through the Fed that we aren't necessarily seeing 
And uh, and don't get me wrong, I don't think most people are really following what's going on at the state level either. I mean, I live in California, so I live in a very different environment than a lot of the rest of the, com uh, the country. I actually just had uh, my blog, or it wasn't really a blog, it was just a little snippet featured in the Levo League uh a Levo League article on where you were on November 8th. And one of the things I said was that, you know, no November 8th of last year, where were you during the last election? And one of the things I said was that I wasn't s shocked at all. Uh, I was devastated, but I wasn't shocked. But it wasn't because a Republican won. I've been unaffiliated my entire voter career since I was 18. I was one of those 18 year olds that actually sat down, read all the platforms and realized there was not going to be one that was going to fit with me. So I've been unaffiliated. I stray away from saying independent because during the last election we had a lot of confusion with American independent versus unaffiliated. So I always use unaffiliated. That basically means you do not choose a party. Uh, as a side note, you did not have to register as a Democrat to vote in the Democratic election last year. That's a huge misconception. In the prelims, you cannot choose to vote on the Republican ballot, but you can choose to vote on the Democratic ballot or on an unaffiliated ballot, which just includes, uh, you know, for example, local propositions or local policies that are nonpartisan. So, and I just, I, I just saw a post the other day that someone said, I'm really disappointed I registered as a Democrat to vote for Bernie Sanders, and that wasn't necessary. And I think that's a really, it's a really important identity thing um, in order to establish. So, in that response, I said that we had over 10 years of signs that this was going to occur in this nation. And I think across the board, the majority of people in the United States agree that the current legislation is not working. I'm sorry, the, the current administration is not working. Uh, I think their approval ratings, someone tell me their approval ratings, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, it's pretty bad of the president. So. I'm not saying this from a liberal or a conservative point of view. I'm saying this as a majority point of view that this isn't working. I love that. I love, I saw Van Jones speak and I wish I, uh, I got, I just got his book. And, and I know people have their personal opinions about his political stance, but uh, what he has to say is very interesting. He's actually doing an entire series where he goes to areas that were primarily Trump supporters to talk to them about why they voted for Trump. And the reason being is because as liberals, which I think he would consider himself liberal, but those of us that are logical liberals realize that we're hypocrites as much as the, the, the conservative side. And I talked a lot about this when I was talking about the Democratic Party's new platform. And he said something that was really impactful. And it really made me start rethinking how I speak about different things in my life, you know, whether it's personally or anything like that, is that liberals, one of the main arguments is that conservatives who voted for Trump are voting against their own economic interests. Well, he made, and that might be true, but he made a very important point that was that liberals do the same thing. They vote to pay taxes to put people in programming or you know to put people children in programming that they'll never use and so technically they're voting against their own economic interests as well and I think that that was a really important point uh, and his whole thing is you know his whole hashtag is think purple instead of red or blue and I think that you know when I need to close up because I only have five minutes this hour always goes by really fast I'm always nervous it's not going to it always does I want to come back to kind of where I always come back is we need to start thinking down the middle and we need to start asking people why they have supported these issues we also need to start looking at the systematic oppression and systematic legislative oppression that's occurred over the last hundred years that has led us to this situation and, and to think that one party was less involved than the other, in my opinion, is silly because I don't think that we've had a leader that we've had great ones. We've had mediocre ones on both sides of the political spectrum, but we've really lacked someone who will come out and be transparent.
these aren't political issues. These are legislative issues. These are monetary issues. These, these affect the people's lives. And we've politicized everything to where you just get one view from the one side, you get one view from the other side. And again, media plays a huge role in this in politicizing everything, but we need to bring it full circle and realize that we as the people, <laughs> to give a cheesy pep talk, we as the people have ultimate control over this situation. The last part of my uh, little snippet that I sent to Levo League is that uh, we're ripe for a time of strategic revolution. I don't think it's going to be a revolution that looks like anything we've ever ever experienced before because it has to be across the aisle, it has to be uh, nonpartisan, and it has to be looking out for each other. And, you know, maybe it's my pie-in-the-sky idea or my age that makes me want to believe that this is possible, but I really do think it is possible. We need to address these microaggressions that both the states and the Fed are making that in general will hurt people and start to understand that this isn't just about any individual family. And, and that's why, again, you know, we're all voting against our own economic interests and we're doing it for different reasons. Uh, sometimes, on, again, on both sides of the spectrum, sometimes it's for others, sometimes it's for ourselves. Uh, but either way, we need to stop having this conversation. We need to stop calling names. We need to stop doing all that. It's non-productive and it's polarizing. And don't get me wrong, like I have very strong opinions about super certain issues that I won't, you know, like my whole commentary about the terrorists versus the, the mentally ill. And I think, you know... Yes, the president addressed that the last shooting was someone that was mentally ill, but again, I don't find that to be a solution to the broader issue and how we message things. That's probably an issue with all of these people that have the capability. They have something wrong. They have some history of violence. They have some PTSD. They have whatever it might be. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to sit here and psychoanalyze people that do commit these crimes. So why not just say that there's an issue here? It has to be addressed. It's not an individual issue. It's not just about the individual people that have done these crimes and their issues. This is a systematic nationwide problem. And a lot of the legislation that's gone through over, like I said, the last hundred years has affected this. This isn't a new issue. And by making it a new issue, we are again being polarizing. Instead of saying this has been an ongoing issue throughout the culture of the United States, maybe from its beginning, maybe in the last hundred years, but we all came to this country, most all of us, uh, besides the native people that were here already, uh, we came to this country to escape persecution. And somehow over the course of the United States history, we now are persecuting each other. And we have created a system where certain people have more rights than others even though we all were immigrants to this country besides, again, the native people that were here. So how then can you rationalize saying, well, I'm better than you. I've been here longer or, you know, any of those kind of issues. And again, I, I don't think that people inherently want to see bad done on others. I think that the media and fear and propaganda that we're all living off of on a daily basis has made it fuzzy. It, it's made us uh, not able to actually translate the information. And again, I hold the media solely responsible for this and the government. The lack of transparency and the lack of honesty that comes through the media and the s severe amount of bias. I, just, I, you know, I had this debate with someone that said, well, those, conser those wacky conservatives just sit around and watch Fox News all day and it's bias. And I had to say, well, CNN, MSNBC is just as biased in the opposite direction. So, you know, that's why I don't watch the I don't watch the news. I only will read the news because I can pull out as soon as I sense a bias, and I will. And that's why, in my show, I go directly to the facts and I want to present the facts. I don't have all the solutions to these issues. These are very, very complex issues, and because of the lack of transparency in government, the federal government keeps so much information from us. I'm sorry, I, I don't care what side of the spectrum you're on. That's a fact. They do not want people to understand what's going on. And they are passing all this legislation that we don't even know about. 
Um, so again, I only got one minute and I want to respect the amount of time that I'm in this time slot. So I'm very happy to continue this conversation. Like I said, I'm looking for people for future shows. If you want to talk about something that I have talked about before, you want to talk about something new, please let me know. Again, you are listening to State of the Union with DG the 30 something on KPCA LP, Petaluma, California, 103.3 FM. You can find us online at KPCA FM, email KPCA at PCA TV. And if you want to try to reach us in snail mail, you can send anything you'd like to P.O. Box 2806, Petaluma, California. Thank you for the time.